Hi, everybody. I have two distinguished guests today from uh, the Roxbury Institute in Advanced uh, Lipidema Treatment, uh, Dr. David Amron and uh, Dr. Aria. And uh, we are talking today about the Lipedema World Congress and uh, sharing our insights in, uh, from the Congress and, and uh, our, our stories from the Congress. And so um, I, uh, Dr. Dr. Amron really doesn't need an a introduction, but he's been doing treating lipedema for, for decades and uh, has, you know, th thousand, uh, th experience with thousands of, of, of helping thousands of ladies with lipedema. And uh, Dr. Aria uh, is uh, is his partner, and they um, are, do research together and uh, just really help uh, the whole lipedema community. And so I'm gonna, um, with that, I'm uh, let, let, uh, hopefully uh, these nice gentlemen will say hi. I gotta jump in right there, though, Thomas. I just gotta <laughs> clarify: is it because you said it two different ways? Is it lipedema or lipedema? That's a great question. And yeah, I, I, th I think, I think, I think, I think, I think we usually say lipedema, but I mean, I've heard lipedema also myself. So I used to say lipedema and now I switch back and forth and I say more lipedema. And the reason wow. is to distinguish it from lymphedema. So if you say lipedema, it sounds a lot like lymphedema. If you say it, especially if you say it fast. And so, you know, lipedema, and this is, this, this this is a great a great place to start with because it's part of the problem about about awareness of this of this disease. I mean, you know, it's lipedema. Now you're saying lipedema. It, it, in many times it was called lipoedema. It's confused with lymphedema. I think that I've said I, I think it wasn't taught to us in medical school because it was given this kind of like weak name with things. We talk even at the Congress World Congress we talked that maybe renaming it lipofibroedema and this and that, but it's it's really interesting. It's got a funny name, lipoedema. But if you say lipoedema, if you say lipoedema or um, lipoedema, then it kind of sounds like liposuction you're tying into it too, which, you know, in some ways you might want to stay away from with the naming of it. Yeah, I know, I know. So this is, I think this is a great discussion, but I don't have, I don't have a, you know, a, a dog in the fight. But but again, when when you speak to the British or they're definitely going to call it uh, lipedema and they're going to, uh, you know, because they and they or at least if, if there's they spell it like they say they would say that. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you know, although we like to follow the British because of the British. Right. Um, and I love the way they speak. Uh, they really never had anything to do with the, with the uh, development of the disease originally, right? Because we know it came from the Americans at the Mayo Clinic in 1940. Yeah, right. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I mean, uh, yeah, that's a good point. And uh, and and uh, yeah. So um, you know, um, do you want to? So I uh, maybe we'll get into the um, um, the Congress, and we'll start with uh, Dr. Uh, Aria's uh, presentation. And so I'm gonna, um, and then we'll talk more. Um, so I'm gonna share the screen and kind of uh, a couple, um, um, uh, so you guys can see my screen. Can, can, can we you- We can see it. Can I ask you a question? I, Cause I, I know we're here at our homes on the weekend. Um, somebody's vacuuming outside my bedroom. Can you guys hear that noise going through? Is it disturbing? No, no, no. I can't hear a thing. All right. Um, so, um, so th this is uh, this is Dr. Aria in action right there, uh, live shot of him um, at the podium uh, talking about his uh, uh, st study with the, the GLP agonists, um, and I think this is a real exciting um, new avenue, and I. I personally recommend uh, GLP agonists for my lipedema ladies who have like a, a secondary obesity um, or, you know, and are struggling with weight. And uh, um, Dr. Arya. Thomas, can I, can I, can I ask, right, you know, I don't think about interrupting, but, you know, right there, um, when you said you recommend it for your patients, which I think these medications I've said is for game changers, just for medicine overall, do you start patients who are, have lipedema? 
or lipedema and are overweight on it right away or before surgery, or do you wait some, some point? So I, I the first visit, um, I, I, I go into uh, a, a, a low carbohydrate, a low refined carb, right? Low, what I call an anti-inflammatory diet, which is low refined uh, uh carbs and, and, and whole foods as much as possible. And, uh, also, uh, recommend, uh, for someone who had, you know, whose BMI is, uh, 35 or higher, uh, to consider, uh, GLP agonists. Um, so yeah, right off the get go. Now, mm -hmm. sometimes that, you know, so for, for some ladies, I, I have, I mean, I'm in the Midwest, so we, we have some people who are, um, uh, who have, have, quite a, quite a bit of secondary obesity. And, and I will, uh, try and get their weight, you know, their BMIs, you know, under 50 before I want to operate. And that is, and some, and, and quite a few of my patients have, have made it there with the GLP agonists and other, other, uh, uh um, other aids. Mm-hmm. There you go. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's, you know, I've, I've, uh, and I want to get on to Dr. Arias' talk because it was so important, but, you know, I think the use of these, of GLP-1 agonists in lipid patients is a very uh, important topic and really interesting topic. You know, currently, I, I think it's, it's used in our practice a lot for patients after surgeries that are um, needing continued weight loss with things. As, as we know, a lot of these patients after the surgery, because you're removing all that hormonally active fat, um, and probably it's the estrogen, um, begin to then lose weight. But I think in patients months later that are not losing weight, I think that's really a great role for these GLP-1 agonists. I think it gener they generally improve more of the so-called non-lipidema fat um, with the weight loss part of it and less proportionately with the lipidema uh, involved areas. That that's great. I, I, so I actually, I mean, I, I know I've probably shared a few years ago I'm, and we're just getting ready to publish, uh, uh, with Wash U, uh, medical school here in, in St. Louis, we're, um, we, we were, we're following these lipedema ladies through weight loss programs and they, uh, and they are losing more weight in their abdomen than in their legs, but they do lose some in their legs. So, you know, yeah. um, yeah. And, and some, you know, there seems to be a proportion of patients that are getting some reduction in symptoms, uh, in pain, sure. um, which is a really interesting thing. Is it something specific that these medications are doing uh, from an anti-inflammatory standpoint, or is it just that they're, they're, they're taking in less inflammatory products because they're eating less food? I think it's a combination of, uh, of all of the above. Probably. Yeah, I, I want I want to let I want to let Doctor you know I want to let one of these young guys speak Doctor Ari and let the old guys stay quiet a little bit. So go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, first and foremost, it's uh, these are revolutionary medications. There were several landmark studies that showed how much improvement patients can get in and their you know in diabetes as well as weight loss. Um, but these medications they they bring with them side effects too, so they should not be given. Um, without proper supervision by board certified experts like endocrinologists. So I, I think they have a they have a role in a lot of patients. Um, and when it comes to lipedema, I mean this these these medications had a lot of press um, last year. There were a lot of celebrities taking them, promoting them. And so a lot of patients would and and just common people, they we would look into these medications as a quick solution for weight loss. Um, um, goes to jump right into it, um, but then understand that these later understand and experience the side effects that come with it, such as constipation, nausea, a lot of GI side effects. And more recently, it looks like the FDA is actually looking into more side effects, like there's a, a claim of um, kind of suicidal ideations and other side effects that are coming with it. So they're looking at it more closely now, um, but they are, they are, you know, in, uh, very helpful for the proper indication. So um, now when it comes to lipedema, a lot of patients were looking into this as a kind of a non-surgical treatment approach. Um, you know, my take on these medications are that 
they have a role. If you have comorbidities, obviously they have a role. So if you have lipedema and you do have diabetes or you do have some other reason um, that GLP-1 receptor agonists can be useful for, then yeah, then it makes sense to be on one with proper supervision. But when it comes to just strictly treating lipedema, I think that um, a lot of our experience has been anecdotal. And we've seen a lot of patients come into the practice on GLP-1 receptor agonists. For the purposes of just lipedema, they, they in, in, in my opinion, they either have been delaying the proper treatment. Um, if the patients need to get liposuction surgery, they've been delaying them, or um, they strictly haven't been really helping as much. Now, obviously, there are cases where patients do see a little bit of improvement in volume reduction. They do see a little bit of improvement in pain, but they are... Um, a very small fraction of a lot of the patients that we've been seeing on these medications who come for consultation. Now, these medications do have some sort of an anti-inflammatory property. There are studies that have been done that show that they decrease inflammatory markers, um, that they increase anti-inflammatory markers as well. So they do have some sort of an anti-inflammatory role. Is this what's contributing to the reduction in pain and symptoms, it's hard to say, but it could be. So there's more research that needs to be done definitely in these medications, but they do have risks. So they need to be done and administered appropriately with proper supervision. Wow, that was great. <clears throat> oh, I, I, um... Yeah, really, really good. I, I have, a, you know, so again, you know, uh, Aria, uh, um, I, well, a couple of things. First of all, I, I read a study late recently that Yes, they, you know, they, they have some side effects, so most, most of them are gastrointestinally related. Uh, with regard to suicidal ideation, there was a recent study that showed apparently there was no increased risk of it as opposed to other weight loss medications in the past. Um, second, secondly, um, from an anti-inflammatory standpoint, and you know this better than I do, um, when you're seeing reduction in, in inflammatory markers, Again, is it something that's specific, do you think, to these medications, or is it that they're they're taking in less inflammatory products? Has that been kind of separated out? They have, they've stratified it. So the question is, is it anti-inflammatory? There's a couple there's a couple reasons. So is it anti-inflammatory because it reduces the, you know, it reduces hemoglobin A1C levels? And then because you, you know, from a diabetes standpoint, if you're improving diabetes, do you get more of an anti-inflammatory role? Yes, but there's also an independent um, that independent thing that's happening that they are having an anti true anti inflammatory role just on a molecular basis. Now, are they also limiting what inflammatory foods you're eating? Yeah, obviously. So if you don't have cravings for pro inflammatory foods, then then yeah, you're that that has some sort of an anti inflammatory property right there. But it does have a very specific, just through cytokines, um, and they they reduce a lot of the pro-inflammatory cytokines just as it's independently. Perfect. I I agree with everything, uh, and and I'm just happy to you know be be part of this discussion. Um, I, would I would say I think I think it's there. You know, it really is these medications are great. They're usually quite well tolerated. I would just say that I think it is, it is fair that, you know, any lipid <clears throat> patient who also has, you know, oh, increased weight for weight loss, it's fine for them to go on it even prior to surgery, like you're using it. My only thing is that I don't want patients too much that really need surgery, especially ones that are becoming more fibrotic to just only depend on that and and realize the importance of possibly or probably needing liposuction concomitantly. I don't want to see these patients wasting years on these medications as a weight loss strategy when the treatment of the lipedema um, with the liposuction is an important consideration. And and also, I, I think that, again, lipedema is such a multidisciplinary, it requires such a multidisciplinary approach. So, you know, obviously we have the assistance of lymphatic specialists, we have the assistance of, you know, different specialties in the care. This is another aspect where you can bring in, for example, endocrinologists to manage yep. a different aspect of it. And I, and I think it's a whole body, you know, we, ha we have to hit it from so many different angles for the total, total care. So just that reinforces I, I, it. I agree.
Uh, there was a, I'm, I'm going to do a couple quick hit hitters. Um, uh, one is, um, <laughs> Uh, the Re Rebecca Dine Hall, and she's from like Cologne, Germany, and um, she did this uh, presentation there um, on um, how the pain reception. So actually, in the ner the the actual uh, nervous inputs, if you would put uh, vibration versus pressure. Um, that there was a difference. Obviously, uh, women with lipedema were more sensitive to pressure in the areas where they had lipedema, but those same areas were had decreased sen uh, sensitivity to uh, vibration, and and similarly, they had um, in areas not affected by their um, by the uh, lipedema, they had normal uh, normal thresholds for sensation, and so. Um, those are that I find that very interesting. It really does, you know. Um, so this really does speak to that there, you know, that this this there's a physiologic basis for the 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 pain that these women have, and 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 she also looked at you know uh, psychological factors, and they um, you know women with lipedema, you know, with any chronic illness will have more psychological stressors. But that did not account for the differences in pain pain perception, and so I thought that was very uh, a, a very important study um, and and uh, validating for our, our ladies with lipedema. Yeah, I think I think what's also what's going on these patients. I mean, you've got you know certainly pain from you know, the inflammation, the fibrosis, um, but because of the congestion and swelling in tissues, in these patients you are having a number of other things go on. One, I, it kind of makes sense, is decreased sens sensation to vibration because the sensory nerves or the nerves that are involved in proprioception are affected by the lipedema and the swelling. And you know, one example of this I'll say is that years ago, you know, I had, had a few patients that told me this after the surgery, or actually I'm say it's before surgery when they were in the shower and they would close their eyes and shampoo their hair they would begin to, to lose their balance. And after the surgeries, one of the first things they noted is that when they closed their eyes, they no longer lost their balance. Yeah. And I'm thinking, that's very interesting. I'm like, well, because I'm always trying to think as we are as doctors and scientists, you know, cause and effect, how is that going on? And I, then I started thinking, you know, what I think is going on is that the swelling is reducing proprioception in their central nervous system. And when you do the surgeries and you reduce it all, their proprioception increases. So um, it, it's, it's very interesting what's going on with, you know, the nerves with, with lipedema. Um, it, so uh, I'm just real quick. I'm the, the, so this, uh, this lymphatic physiologist, uh, John Paul Belgrado was, he was talking, he just kind of went through, anatomy and physiology lymphatics and uh he did a couple he, one thing is um the deep lymphatic circulation that starts in the hands and the feet and um um uh, and some some uh, of the lymphatic circulation actually uh some actually uh comes some of the some actually comes in the legs actually goes to the foot before it comes back up and i i, I found that really interesting and i um 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 it just uh and so i made a slide on it and um and also he talked about what we call the semi protected or partially protected uh lymphatic collectors and this is uh this is a um uh, so, something that i'm passionate about with where they they are are um, they these the main collectors are uh follow the uh the the saphenous the small and great saphenous so the small saphenous in the back of the leg and the and the great saphenous in the in, in, uh, uh, front and medial um, and they um, and so they though those structures themselves are either sometimes in the the um, saphenous uh, fascia or parallel and and when they are parallel they're right on the epifascial way and those so those are generally um um 
protected. And that's something I'm always worried about when I do surgery is not, um, not causing lymphatic damage. Um, can I, can I, can I, I, I want to just comment on that for a minute or two, even, um, you know, so what you're, what you're showing here is really interesting. And it's something that, you know, I've kind of said for years, um, you know, when you use that term lymphatic sparing with any liposuction procedure, what does that really mean? I mean, obviously it means not damaging the lymphatic system. We know that, but you know, what, what really qualifies that? And I've said for years, I, I think it is staying in the proper plane with things because the deeper lymphatics or the principal lymph collectors like you're showing here are underneath things. They're deeper down. They're under that, that, that superficial fat layer and fascial plane in a deeper plane. And as long as the surgeon is staying in that proper or what I call safe plane, they really shouldn't be causing lymphatic damage to the deeper principal lymph collectors. Now, you know, if you, if you are, you know, completely not smart about things and you affect the lymphatic capillaries to a great degree, I guess you can cause lymphatic damage. But I'll, I'll say something about that. You know, it, it also you think, let's say you're using certain energy-based devices, you know, in, in liposuction or vasors or something like that. And a person is being very so-called aggressive. Even in a normal patient without lipedema, wouldn't that surgeon cause lymphedema, even, even a normal patient, if they're damaging the lymphatic capillaries? So I really think it, it's that it's a deeper damage to the principal lymph collectors that can create lymphedema in any type of liposuction. Does that make sense? Yeah, I agree completely with that. And, uh, and um, so I, I actually think in most liposuction, even even um, the lymphatic capillaries more at the surface are, 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 or, or at least they're, uh, um, they're, they're, the, the, if not the pre-capillaries, at least the capillaries and, and, um, and, and smaller distributing vessels are, are disrupted in, in liposuction, even, even relatively gentle liposuction. Um, and I think that it's, it, it really is, uh, these, uh, like, like you said, David is the, the principal collectors that are down in these semi-protected areas. And I think that's, um, in, um, um, what, what, what matters. And, um, and, um, yeah, so I think, uh, I, 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 we're, we're, we, again, we're in agreement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the lymphatic capillaries, which are certainly important in this superficial subcutaneous layer of fat, that, you know, those are many times very much affected by the fibrosis that goes on with lipedema. And I, and a lot of patients have a lot of, of subdermal fibrosis, just clinging under the dermis, the superficial layer of fat, and really just affecting the lymphatic flow. And once the liposuction surgery is properly done and you release that fibrosis properly, you're really decongesting the area and, and generally getting better lymphatic flow with things. And, and you know, I, I'm not a vein guy or lymphatic specialist, but that's, you know, that's my experience understanding with it. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, these lymphatic capillaries are, are, are like, like one to three millimeters. That's less than the width of a credit card. Um, they're just right at the surface. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, I just, this is to me fascinating and I could talk for hours, but I, we're on a schedule. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I gotta say, you know, you, um, I'll just tell the people that might be listening to this, you know, we started, we had a schedule today with, uh, yourself I and Dr. Ari, and we're you know talking about certain research things together. And I didn't know what the what the meeting was for. And I just showed up here in my little sweat outfit. And all of a sudden, I realized we're doing a podcast or video cast. Uh, so I, I I apologize, and I want to uh, tell the audience and watching that uh, I uh, I was not clear, and I feel um, and I feel please do not uh, form any judgments of what. Uh, Dr. Uh, Aria or Dr. Amran um, are where yeah. in their home, in the comfort of their home. 
Yeah, I, re- I really sat here in this meeting with a guitar next to me, just going to relax and talk with you. And so, you know, that if you hear my kids scream back at or my wife screaming at me, again, I, I didn't realize, you know, I'm in my bedroom right here with my wife well, walking around. So if she screams well, at me, well, please excuse things. We'll cut all that out. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> um, uh, one other, the one other one I was gonna, I made a, a little thing on was uh, Dr. Uh, Gabrielle uh, Farber, and she looked, and and so this is one of my other like pet peeves is how BMI is such a poor, um, a met poor um, indices derived value on in lipedema, yeah, because. Um, uh-huh. And so, so because it, you know, it, it it overestimates obesity in lipedema women, and um, and this is just so. If you look at their, you know, using a, a more a fair metric would be waist to height, waist to uh, uh, height ratio, and that, um, um, you know, uh, still there's you know greater um, patients are overweight, but. Um, but it's but it's a but it's a it's not as many as would be classified as obese by uh, BMI. So um, and so and but this was a very good study where because you can so you know waist to height ratio has has a better indices of metabolic health. In other words, so your waist circumference um, ha- has more to do with you know, diabetes and other cardio cardiovascular um, diseases, um, and and so lipedema women, um, e- even even larger lipedema can have very small waist, and 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 so um, so what we when we think of obesity, we think of it in terms of its metabolic consequences, but but those aren't really necessarily so for a larger lady uh, with lipedema still with a small waist. Again, again, we're right on the same page with each other. And, and I love uh, just this topic because it's something that I, I've i been you know saying for years, I really despise the BMI index um, in terms, especially in terms of how it's usually applied to <clears throat> lipid patients. I think it gets patients in trouble. It creates dead ends with things. Um, it's, it's an archaic uh, index that was developed over 200 years ago that, you know, we know there's studies that show it's increased you know, patients with high BMIs or surgical risks and all that stuff with it. But I really, I really think it's problematic in terms of generally being applied to lipidema patients. And to be more specific, you know, I'll say that, you know, a lot of surgeons and a lot of surgical centers will not allow patients with BMIs above 40 or 35 to undergo liposuction surgery or orthopedists will not do any type of procedure many times on patients with a higher BMI index. And in lifting of patients, it's very difficult for them to lose weight. They've done all these weight loss strategies their whole life. Many of these patients are referred for bariatric surgery simply to get their BMI index down to a so-called safe place. So an arthroscopy can be done or something. I, I think it's completely ridiculous with it. Um, and and I think that 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 patients um, and this, this is where the GLP ones play play an interesting role in things. Okay, I think it's great put patients who are very overweight on GLP ones even before surgery, but it should not prevent this the important surgery from taking place. Um, you know, I've commonly I do patients with BMIs above forty. I do I do them above fifty. I do them to sixty. I do them to sixty two. Each patient is different if it's done safely and properly. And I really despise the BMI index. We 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 agree here that yeah. and that's why I thought this study was very good. But um, yeah. I I'm gonna um, so I I gave a talk there um, and um, on my paper that I that that just got it just got published like two weeks after the conference um, and so um, um, you know on on knee range of motion mechanics mobility stuff and um, if. If you want, I can talk a little bit more about that, but I don't want to, you guys, um, I don't want to bore, bore anybody here. Cause I could talk for all, all day long. I, you know, and I bring, and I bring this up with many patients to your, um, your, your presentation, how, and, and Dr. Amron, we always mention to patients how improving lipedema in general and doing surgeries improves a lot of the, um, 
joint pain and uh, a lot of those symptoms that they have, but also improves um, with the, your findings. It also helps improve um, range of motion. So it's, yeah. it's, it's very important. It's, it's honestly, Thomas, Thomas, it's, it's hugely important. Your work important. with this is very important because it's substantiating um, functional issues in patients with lipedema. And this oh. helps to substantiate the treatment of lipedema um, in, uh, for insurance companies. Right. Um, so it's, it's hugely important. Very important, Tom. Important for patients. Yeah. Very important. Thank you. I, I, well, I, I'm going to give another plug. Be, well, I'm going to give a little more detail then. And, so one of the things I'm pr most proud of is that, so I use these, um, this NIH uh, tool, the uh, promise and, and um, uh, mobility score. And, and so that's standardized to the U S population. And, um, and it's also used in orthopedics. And um, so these, uh, so the, the mobility gains uh, from the lipedema reduction surgery were comparable or better than the mobility gains from a total knee replacement. And wow. similarly, the wow. knee, yeah, I, yeah. Um, well, and, and, you know, and, it's, it's really interesting, Tom. I, I, one of my closest friends is an orthopedic surgeon. And um, when I would show him a lipedema knee, he's like, ah, we're not going in there. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do surgery in that. Um, and that, that, and if, if, if you're not going to do surgery in that, and the patient is going to have a lot of pain and, you know, decreased range of motion, then definitely they do require our help to, to go in there and improve that range of motion before they see, um, orthopedic surgery specialists, uh, orthopedic well, surgeons. At, you know, at, absolutely true. The orthopedists are, are thrilled at what we do yeah. to make the, the health of that area around the knee better. I mean, you're, it's not just the weight issue you're decreasing all that congestion of fibrosis around the knee joint. Right. But interesting, I, I never knew that, that what you're saying, that, that the liposuction itself is, is improving the range of motion more than the orthopedic surgery in the average patient. Um, yeah. That's that's it. yeah. So, so um, the average, um, so like knee flexion, you know, that's just a simple thing. How, how far can you bend uh, your knee? Well, um, your average lipedema patient has a restriction of uh, uh, about ten to twenty degrees. In stage three, they all they, they almost invariably have because of the way it, it you know kind of right at the top of their calf and the back of their thigh, those get so so enlarged that they they have about twenty plus degrees. Well, um, the and they get on average about a 10 degree improvement in knee range of motion well hmm. the average um the average total knee replacement gets about three to five and wow. and um and what what makes it even more important is you know like you were saying these are higher risk patients um if you do a total and why orthopedics don't want to touch them is if they have one of the biggest causes for uh, failed knee surgery or failed knee replacement <coughs> is called is is called arthrofibrosis or where they don't where they're not able to bend their knee um, um, sufficiently um, and, and and so they so the the problem is is that then they don't get all the mobility you have to be able to bend your knee like you know 15 degrees to go uh, 115 degrees to go up and down stairs say safely and you have to be able to um you know to to run you got about 115 you need about 115 degrees well you know if you're like at 105 which many of my stage three lipedema ladies are you know they can't do that and if they go do a total knee replacement, they're gonna they're so high risk for a failed knee replacement. But if they do the surgery first, then yeah, it's like you see that that you know insurance companies again, you know, if they would be paying attention to this stuff, they'd realize. I mean, you know, patients are getting bariatric surgery with lipedema many times covered by insurance when when really it's not the right type of initial treatment for patients. Similarly, now you're you're saying with orthopedic surgery sometimes. You know, they may not need orthopedic surgery if the liposuction surgery is done um, or at a minimum make the tissue healthier for the subsequent orthopedic surgery. Yeah, I mean, it's all variable, but I, I, I but 
in for most patients that it's it's better to do that first um um and 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 then yeah and and of course it would make so much i mean it may because you know what a failed knee surgery is 60 to 100 grand to an insurance company and um uh, you know and yeah i mean this is i mean it's it, it makes safe sense for the patients it makes sense for you know every everybody sure. insurance sure. companies the are are you know just the amount of money we spend on health care all those things uh if we do it you know if this is yeah so um and then i wanted to so this is um one one last thing I wanted to kind of talk about. Well, one is what you know. What an amazing conference! I mean, all the people from all over the world, and it was just. Um, and then, uh, and then this is a picture of the. Um, uh, so that's just some people. Uh, some some, but but they're also the second picture on the on the on the lower right is um, is during the Delphi uh, consensus. So I think it was really important that all these for the first time you know all the experts in lipedema uh, gathered for uh, to get, and then we are um worked on a consensus document on what what we know about lipedema and what we don't know yeah i, re I remember that that was a, a really great i feel like we didn't even have enough time for it there was so much to go through but going through that document you know each point of it and and voting on things and agreeing and disagreeing was really important. Yeah, yeah, I, I uh, you, yeah, we all made our plugs for our things. Oh, I did. Oh, I did. Yeah, I, I did. I did get. Yeah, I did get to do a little surgery demonstration too. So that was a, that was, um, that was it. Um, I, um, uh, man. So anything more? What do tell me? Like. What were your some of your highlights um, uh, or something? Please, uh, if you have any 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 anecdote stories, anything uh, you would like to share. Aria, you want to go? So the the biggest highlight for me was was meeting so many so many um, remarkable people from all around the world, from Australia to Germany, you know, to Italy, right? So. Um, I mean, we we met brilliant brilliant minds when we were there, like Dr. Amin Cheyenne, who the brilliant surgeon in, in Australia. So we we Dr. Goats is such a kind gentleman and and so selfless. So we you know it was very nice to to see all the different people and how passionate everybody is about treating patients with lip, with lipedema from all different aspects, not just surgically but non surgically as well. So I thought that was that was great. Um, the meeting was. More, much more, um, you know, when I went into it, I didn't think it was going to be as as big as it was. When we went there, we, we saw so many people, so many, you know, brilliant minds. Um, so I thought that was the, the the highlight, really, was meeting so many people who are so passionate about it. Yeah, you know, I, I'd have to agree. That was really well said. It's, it's that same thing about meeting all these uh, people from around the world and realizing that there is so much going on around the world by you know, qualified people, people that are passionate about it, contributing to research and therapeutic improvement with it. Um, you know, this was the first World Congress meeting. I didn't know what to expect also, quite honestly. You know, we went there, you know, we flew all the way to Germany. I was looking for every reason to kind of get out flying across the Atlantic, but but I realized it was an important thing to do. Dr. Ari and I went together and um, I decided not to speak or submit a talk for this meeting. Uh, Dr. Arya did, and I think it was a great talk. You know, probably next meeting I will submit a talk to it because because I realize you know it really is a significant meeting, um, and and they really have it going on. So, you know, I'm actually proud to be part of it, um, and I think it was great. It was great. Yeah, you know, me, I'll say next next time. You know, uh, oh, go go ahead, go ahead for you. Go ahead. Oh no 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 yeah no I uh so for me too it was like you know meeting all these people. Um, I mean some of these people like you know. Uh, 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 Dr. Cheyenne from Australia. I had read, I've been, I've read his papers. I remember I've studied his papers and, but I just, um, you know, I'd never met him and that was, you know, a thrill, um, you know, similarly, um, you know, um, uh, Hocken Borson, uh, Borson, um, you know, I mean, I've been reading his stuff for years and, and, you know, got, you know, got 
got to meet him and he, even, you know, yeah. So, ha so that was very nice. And then I also want to say one other thing is I, what I thought was really nice the way they incorporated the patient, um, the lipedema patient societies into it. I thought they did, that was nice because, um, and they did it, uh, I, I thought in a, in, in, in a very, uh, a, a classy way to, you know, that, that I thought was, um, um, you know, I, maybe maybe we should think about that some when, for our our um, our conferences. Yeah, you know, I I I've, I've been in practice about thirty years, almost twenty nine years, and I've been to you know like all of us tons of medical conferences. I got to admit, this was, I think, the second conference I actually went to outside of the United States, um, but was just again so impressed. You know, it made me actually want to go to more international conferences just overall. Um, and, you know, maybe it was a colorful mix of different people and personalities, but it was really a great, great energy. It was just very, like, enlightening, inspiring. And it was a really great sharing of information in, 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 a, in a lovely way. So it just kind of turned me on to wanting to go to more international conferences overall. That's great. Well, I, 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 again, thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, a bit of your precious weekend uh, with, with me and, um, to, and I, um, and I really do appreciate it. I'm again, I'm uh, apologies for, uh, um, you know, kind of springing. I, I thought never, I don't know. No, it's okay. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm going I'm to pull, I'm going to pull my guitar back in my hand again. And start, All right. All right. Start you want to, you want to play us out? <laughs> no, I don't think I'd do that. It's an electric guitar also. It's not plugged in. But, you know, next time I will. I'll prepare a little something, a little ditty for us. But, you know, next time, you know, I'd love to come back on, Thomas, because um, I think it's a great uh, great thing you're doing. Uh, first of all, I think you're doing great work with lipedema just in general, advancing research. But I think that, you know, I'm all about increasing awareness and education. I think this is a, a lot of great stuff we talk about, important stuff. One topic I'll say that I want to talk to you about, but not today. We don't have time in this net is um venous stuff oh yeah in lipid patients and this is an area of specialization for you venous yeah. insufficiency other vascular okay. things the role of things when to do what and all that that stuff but we're going to save it for next time all right all right that that's it we're going to tease the audience and tell them they have to tune in for another time and i um, right so and I'll, and I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll play guitar that time oh uh, there you go there you go um <laughs> And uh, all right. Well, thank you again. And I'm uh, signing off, uh, uh, wishing everybody the best of health. Thank you. Take care then. Right, take care. Bye. Have a good Bye. weekend.